for those of you who I haven't met, my name is Barrett Berger. I'm the Executive Director for CAPI, the Center for the Advancement of Public Integrity. Um, if you are not currently involved with CAPI, um, this is a fantastic time to start doing so. Um, we have a number of different pro bono projects that are listed on Simplicity right now. We're going to be adding more. Um, we have a whistleblower project that's ongoing. We're going to be uh, having some dealing with Brazilian corruption. So if you are an LLM student or somebody who happens to be passionate about about all things corruption in Brazil. You might want to check that out. Uh, and then we're going to have a lot more projects that will be posted um, probably in the next few weeks. Uh, additionally, we still have room for summer interns. So if you are uh, a 1L or a 2L still looking for an internship this summer, um, please feel free to reach out. All right, with that being said, I want to go ahead and get started and introduce our fantastic uh, panelists here. Um, so right next to me uh, is John Castiglione from um, the New York Attorney General's Office. He's a senior enforcement counsel there. Uh, Jackie Kasoulis is the chief of the business and securities fraud section for the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of New York. And next to her is Mark Berger, who is the regional director um, of the New York Office of the SEC. So with this being said, we're going to let these panelists tell you a little bit about their background, how they got to where they are, and then we'll jump into it. Um, all right, so just to start things off, can you guys each briefly describe sort of the path your career took from law school to where you are now? Uh, so John, why don't you go ahead? Sure. Um, thanks, everyone. So I, let's see, I went to law school at uh, GW down in DC. I graduated in 2006. Uh, from there, I went to Latham and Watkins here in New York. Um, I was with our uh, securities litigation and professional responsibility practice group, uh, which really meant that I uh, was on the defense side of class action securities cases. Um, I was there for six or seven years. Some, somewhere, somewhere in there. Um, and in 2014, I joined the Attorney General's office in our Investor Protection Bureau, uh, which is a civil securities and commodities fraud enforcement bureau. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about uh, what that is. Um, you know, in terms of uh, sort of how I got there, um, you know, it was a little bit of happenstance, a little bit of a desired career shift. I would say around 2013, um, I got married, I had a kid, and my wife uh, it was really the, um, you know, career driver. She's a pediatric cardiologist uh, at NYP Columbia, um, as well as a researcher. And so um, as we were having our family, one of us had to maybe downshift a bit, and I, I emphasis on a bit. Um, and so it was around that time, actually, that a, part, a former partner at Latham uh, became the bureau chief of the Investor Protection Bureau. His name is Chad Johnson, and he sort of recruited me to the position. So it was a confluence of events and um, a little bit of a substantive career shift as well. Um, at Latham and Watkins, I had essentially done litigation um, in terms of class action work as well as heavy involvement in our pro bono um, uh, projects. And so this position was a little bit more at the AG's office, was a little bit more of an investigative position, not um, nearly as much courtroom time, um, you know, perhaps a little less even than I had expected coming in. But it's, you know, it's been five years now, and I've uh, very much enjoyed my time there. Um, get to do a lot of different things. Again, I'm sure we'll talk about uh, uh, that here today. But that's kind of how I got uh, to where I am now. Great. And one thing I do want to come back to, so all three of you I know uh, made a transition at some point from private practice into the government. Then, Mark, I know you went back to private practice and then back to the government again. So it's one of the topics I want to talk about is sort of how, it, you know, what the differences are between working in the public sector and, and working in private practice and sort of giving the students an idea of, you know, that as a potential career path of not necessarily having to find yourself firmly rooted in, in one of those two fields. Uh, so, Jackie, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your path. Sure. So I went to Columbia Law. I'm a proud graduate. Um, I, I came to law school not really having a good sense of what I wanted to do with my legal degree. My first summer of law school, I went home to Tampa, Florida, and I interned at the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Middle District of Florida in the Criminal Division. And that's when I knew that at some point in my career I wanted to be an assistant U.S. Attorney. I just had a fantastic summer. It was a great experience. I came back. Um, I 
took a lot of classes, um, did some internships and clinics, which maybe we can talk about in a little bit more detail in a little bit, to try to help um, develop my skill set to make me someone who could be a good candidate to be in AUSA. But uh, I paid for law school on my own um, through student loans, like I'm sure many of you are doing. And so I knew I had to spend some time in private practice. So after I graduated, I went to Kirkland and Ellis, actually, for four years, I think, in total. I started the application process at the end of my third year, spent an additional year at the firm before I started with the US Attorney's Office. Um, and I worked in the litigation group here in New York and actually had a, a very positive experience. I think a lot of people think it's just sort of time that they're going to have to spend at a firm to get to a place they ultimately want to be. But I actually had a really positive experience. I was on two different trial teams. I took or defended a bunch of depositions um, and, and really had a, a positive experience, had a lot of you know great mentorships. And then I ultimately decided that I was in a financial position to transition into private, excuse me, um, into doing some more public service type work threw in my applications and ended up at the US Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of New York in Brooklyn, um, along with Barrett, who is in my, um, well, there's some dispute as to whether we're in the same general crimes class or not. We won't go into that here. I was like two months senior to her, so yeah, kind so. of a big deal. <laughs> depend the end of the year day I don't know anyway we were you know within months of each other of starting in the office um, I've been at the US Attorney's Office now for 11 years which I can't believe um, I did a rotation in general crimes and then I did organized crime work for a um, I think three to four year time period uh, I took maternity leave I have um, six-year-old now twins and I came back and joined the business and securities fraud section and then went and worked for Barrett as the deputy chief in general crimes, then came back to my section and I've now, I was promoted to chief of the business and securities fraud section about two years ago now. Um, and my husband, I met through the job and he was at the Southern District of New York, the US Attorney's Office. He recently left to go back into private practice. So we were a Department of Justice family um, as Barrett and, and Mark were for a, a good period of time. Um, and so again, I can probably speak a little bit to that back and forth transition as well. Perfect. All right, Mark, you're up. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I guess we'll start in law school. Well, I went to Cornell undergrad, and the weather wasn't so great up there. So I uh, went down to Charlottesville, Virginia um, for law school and um, had really great years at UVA. Um, I, it was interesting. I, um, I signed on to summer at a firm. It was a litigation boutique firm called Donovan Leisure Newton and Irvine. It's not around anymore. And it actually wasn't around for me to go there as a summer associate. Um, because in the time that I signed on after interviewing uh, and before my 2L summer, it was swallowed up by um, a large California firm known as Oric Harrington. So um, I went to work at Oric with the entire Donovan group, um, which was actually great and exposed me to a lot of things that you know just a litigation boutique probably would not have. Um, I, I always knew that I wanted to clerk, um, but I didn't want to clerk directly out of law school. And so I worked for about a year, a uh, year and a half. And, um, and then I clerked for Judge Berman in the Southern District of New York. Um, and I think, it, well, I know it's much more common now to spend a few years working at a firm um, and then clerk. In fact, I think the majority of um, the benches here, Eastern District of New York and Southern District, the local federal benches um, prefer to have clerks that have uh, experience um, on the cir Second Circuit as well, same. But at the time I did it, um, the, the reverse was true, and most people were straight out of law school. Um, but I do think both you as a sort of law student, young practitioner, clerk, benefits as well as the judge uh, from having a little bit more maturity, some years under your belt, some real firm experience. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, when I was clerking, I was exposed to um, prosecutors at the US Attorney's Office. Um, and they were just doing really cool stuff, like organized crime cases and high level narcotics cases. So I realized that's what I wanted to do um, and applied. Um, fortunately for me, 
um, U.S. attorney was someone by the name of Jim Comey at the time, who is about stands about six foot seven and really wanted tall people, I think, in the office. So that helped me out um, uh, get in at the time. So that was about 2002, uh, and I stayed in there for about 12 years. Left in 2014, and in those 12 years. Um, went through a, a few rotations. I actually spent most or, or a good chunk of that time doing international narcotics prosecutions, uh, which was fascinating um, and involved travel down to Colombia, Venezuela, Thailand, um, uh, Europe. Um, and I realized it was time to probably get out of um, doing drug cases when I heard my last name spelled out on one of the Colombian wiretaps that we were listening as who's the prosecutor on that case. And then they broke my last name down into six letters. And my mom said, why don't you move into white collar work? Um, so always listen to mom. Um, and, I, uh, and I then started doing white collar work, uh, which I did for the next few years. Um, was fortunate enough to eventually be able to uh, run the white collar unit uh, in the Southern District that uh, it was a really interesting time. Um, we brought the Madoff case. We brought the case against Raj Rajaratnam. We brought the case against SAC Capital. So some of the bigger hedge fund insider trading cases, some of the big Ponzi scheme cases. Uh, I left um, to go to Ropes and Gray, where I was a white collar defense attorney uh, representing um, sort of half individuals and half um, entities. And those entities you know, could be banks. Uh, hedge funds, private equity firms, uh, public companies. Uh, really enjoyed it, did it for about three or four years. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that made it okay to leave the U.S. Attorney's Office after 12 years, uh, which is a tough thing to leave because it's a fantastic job, was the thought that eventually I would have another opportunity to come back into government. Um, and luckily enough, uh, that opportunity presented um, in the beginning of 2018, uh, when I uh, took over uh, the New York office uh, of the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, where I've been now for about a year or so. We'll talk a little bit more about what that office does um, in a little bit. But um, it's um, just to hit on Barrett's point about um, going back and forth. And then there's one other thing I forgot, which I'll loop back to. Um, there is, you know, this concept of a revolving door, and there's a lot of criticism. You know, are people going into the government, out of the government, representing entities, and then they're back in the government, and now, you know, do can they charge those entities that they just represented? You know, in my experience, your loyalty is, you know, in the place you're at. And you can be a very hard prosecutor, a hard-charging prosecutor, and when you're on the defense side, um, you do everything in your client's best interests, and I, I don't see people bending the rules or playing favoritism, but what I do see is you get a lot of experience and insight into how people think, how prosecutors think, which is helpful on the defense side, and vice versa. The last thing I'll mention, I probably um, need to mention um, and should mention, um, a very important thing happened to me when I was um, a young prosecutor. Um, I had a great experience of appearing before one judge, um, in particular, um, and um, he had a particular clerk, um, and I wound up uh, getting married to that clerk. And that was when I was at That's the That's me, in case home. that wasn't totally obvious. That wasn't, that wasn't his first wife. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thanks for that. Um, see, there you go. Get a clerkship, find a wife. So everyone benefits. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm blushing. So I want to talk a little bit about, um, we'll go back to this, this idea of public-private uh, options here, but I do want to just get out there sort of the, a little bit of the nature of what you're each doing in your current positions because each of these entities really, you know, works within the financial markets but kind of serves a unique purpose and, and you all have very distinct roles in that. Um, so maybe we can start on the, on the state side with the AGs. We, we could, yeah. although it might be easier. Uh, I think part of what I will say is that we are in some sense separate and almost in a gap filling role sometimes. Um, that might not quite be the right word, but maybe it makes sense uh, to describe what you guys do, and that'll put a little more context to what a state securities enforcement office does. Um, so Even better. Jackie, you go first. Mm -hmm. Sure. So what we, we are responsible for in our section, it's business and securities fraud. So if you can think about that, that's, I mean, that's just 
basically saying anything related to white collar for the most part is what the mandate of our section is. So we are responsible for prosecuting the federal fraud statutes, as I think the sort of simplest way to put it. And so in my section, that sort of can run the gamut from securities fraud cases. So for example, um, my section prosecuted, I was on the trial team of Martin Shkreli, the pharma bro who was convicted for securities fraud um, back in the summer of 2017. So that was a securities fraud, wire fraud case. So we do those sorts of cases, insider trading cases, um, what we call microcap fraud, which is what um, basically you've probably heard of as like pump and dump schemes where fraudsters will take control of a small company, pump up the stock through false promotions, fake press releases, and they're basically sort of taking advantage of um, you know, vulnerable populations like the elderly, for example. So um, you know, securities fraud cases is obviously sort of a, a, a primary mandate of our section. We also do a lot of Foreign Corrupt Practices Act work. So, um, and I know that there's in our, in our respective offices, there's a focus on domestic uh, political corruption, but we also focus on foreign corruption and, and in particular business involvement in the corruption of foreign officials. So businesses paying bribes um, to get some sort of business advantage over other companies, bribes to foreign officials. Um, and so we do a lot of um, prosecutions related to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and we can talk a little bit more about that. We also do a lot of healthcare fraud work. Uh, we do tax fraud. Um, there used to be a bit more of a robust interest in mortgage fraud cases, you know, post-2008. We sort of cycled through that. Um, but a renewed or a new focus on cyber-enabled fraud, uh, fraud related to cryptocurrencies and money laundering. So, you know, we have a, obviously a, a pretty broad mandate. Um, we're really creative in the way that we use the federal fraud statutes and the money laundering statutes. Um, and so we often, we do the criminal side of those investigations and we routinely partner with our civil partners the SEC, for example, the CFTC, um, and we also partner on the criminal side with um, different units down in the criminal division. So we're the U.S. Attorney's Office. There's, you know, U.S. Attorney's Office is scattered all throughout the country, but there are also units in the criminal division in the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C., who are responsible for um, working certain kinds of cases. So for example, in the FCPA space, there is an FCPA unit in Washington um, who we partner with when we bring FCPA cases. Um, we also work with all of the federal law enforcement agencies like the FBI, the Postal Inspection Service, the IRS, um, and we will at times um, make sure that we're partnering or at least deconflicting with our state counterparts. So that can be the Attorney General's office, the Manhattan DA's office, the Brooklyn DA's office. So one of the things I always emphasize or talk about with respect to white collar work is there are a lot of different players um, which you know can make it um, you know, challenging, but also really interesting um, because everyone's bringing different skill sets and they're bringing different tools to the table to make sure that you're really able to address, um, you know, these sort of these fraudulent schemes and make sure that the victims are made whole as best you can. Um, Mark, maybe you can talk a little bit about sort of the separate oversight capacity that the SEC has. Um, but also I wanted to follow up on something that Jackie was saying is, as far as the you know, securities fraud cases that they're bringing, you know, really trying to help out some of the vulnerable populations. And Mark, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the outreach efforts that your office has been doing um, on behalf of some of those more vulnerable populations. Yeah, sure. So just, I mean, very big picture. Um, the SEC is an independent agency. We have at the very top five presidentially appointed commissioners. Uh, right now, there are four sitting. There's one seat that still needs to be filled, but um, I guess Congress has other things to do for a while, so we'll get a fifth commissioner at some point. Um, our biggest office is in Washington, D.C. It's known as the Home Office. There are 11 other regional offices around the country. Um, New York here is the largest of those regional offices. Um, the SEC basically has a three-part mission. Um, first, first, 
um, to facilitate capital formation. Um, second, to maintain you know, fair um, uh, markets out there, markets with integrity. Uh, and third, and this is the area that probably hits you know, closest to home to what I do on a day-to-day -day basis and my office does, is investor protection efforts. Okay, so just focusing on that third area, investor protection, um, the, the New York office um, is composed of really essentially two main groups. Um, I've got an enforcement group, which are um, about 200 staff attorneys, investigators, accountants um, that bring enforcement cases. Um, and then I've got about 200 examiners um, who go on examinations, which is basically going into the field to people who are required to be registered with us. So those could be um, hedge funds, investment advisors, investment companies, broker-dealers. And they go and make sure that, you know, there are proper procedures in place, that money is where it should be, uh, is where they're representing it is, um, that there's money in, act in clients' accounts. Um, so they're sort of the the field team, that's almost the first line of defense to see if there's any smoke there. And sometimes if they see smoke, um, or if they see flat out fraud, forget about smoke, um, that exam program can refer cases to the enforcement program. So we actually have, in a way, sort of, we can self-generate cases for the enforcement end. Um, and the cases the enforcement group brings range from every, everything from fraud cases, so cases that Jackie and her group would bring, and, and often you'll see a case, an insider trading case, let's say, that has both a criminal and an SEC um, component to it, um, because we use the same statutes for those cases. Uh, we both use statutes in the Securities Act. Um, so those are intent-based fraud cases, but sort of the area that we then fill beyond what the criminal folks can fill are uh, violations where there may not have been scienter. So you may have, um, we can bring cases where someone did something recklessly or, or negligently um, to violate the securities laws. Again, those same statutes, but just not with intent. We can f sort of fill that niche and bring those cases. Um, and we can also bring a whole host of other cases that, are, that, that don't sound in fraud at all. Um, they may be more regulatory cases. So a, a lot of these, you know, cryptocurrency issues that we've been reading about, we have brokers out there that are um, acting as brokers for cryptocurrency, but they're not registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission as a broker. So we can bring cases if someone fails to register as a broker with us when they're actually acting as a broker. So I'd sort of call that bucket more regulatory type cases in nature. And then we have other cases where you have more technical violations where people, you know, may have operated under a conflict of interest or people may not have had um, their accounts audited as they should have had their accounts audited. The money may all be there, but they didn't follow certain rules and have those accounts looked into. We bring a whole host of those cases as well. So I think, you know, the area that we fill um, is in line with Jackie's group, um, and then goes well beyond it, what we can't do is put anybody in jail. And that's why working with the criminal authorities and having, you know, that threat of someone potentially going to jail um, is much more severe um, and is a, is a much stronger deterrent than anything that we can bring to the table, which mostly is, you know, taking their money and putting money back in investors' pockets, which is a very important part of our mission. Um, and we can kick people out of the industry so they can't be a director of a company anymore or they lose their broker license, they can't be a broker anymore. We can do those things um, but not ultimately put somebody in jail. Do you guys try to charge uh, cases or bring cases simultaneously? Do you try to stagger them with one, one entity going first? How do you handle that? So um, in an ideal world, we bring cases together um, and, you know, that's really known as sort of parallel investigations. Our investigations are separate and independent. The Department of Justice has their mandate and their mission, um, and, and, and the SEC has our own separate mandate mission and our own separate client, which is the commissioners. Um, but we often have similar interests, and to make things more efficient, uh, to make the process work, um, to make the investigation go more smoothly, we will often together do our interviews.
um, or together, you know, look at some documents, but ultimately, and, and figure out when we're going to bring a case down. So together, you know, the person is charged and the SEC files its suit, um, but they're both independent investigations. All right, John, you're not getting away this time. So, <clears throat> there's going to be a quiz about all this uh, <laughs> later, what we all do. Um, so I work for the Attorney General of New York. Uh, the Attorney General is an elected position um, going back, you know, hundreds of years at this point. I work for our Investor Protection Bureau, which is charged with enforcing the Martin Act, which is the New York State anti-securities fraud law um, that actually predates the federal securities laws by several years. It was passed in 1921, I believe. And so throughout the years, that law has changed. It's been added to. Um, there are a number of other New York state laws uh, that my bureau, in, in partnership with other bureaus at the Attorney General's office, uh, that we enforce um, having to deal with various types of business frauds or, or, or things of that nature. Um, and so maybe the best or easiest way to think of what we do is, you know, to the extent there is a securities fraud that has a nexus to the state of New York, um, we have the ability to investigate uh, and, if necessary, necessary, either prosecute criminally or bring a civil enforcement action um, with regards uh, to that behavior. Um, so because New York is, you know, the financial capital of the U.S., um, oftentimes we have the ability to investigate and prosecute the same sorts of cases um, that, that you've been hearing about. And so, um, you know, it probably makes sense with in talking about this panel, you know, we will from time to time partner uh, with a U.S. Attorney's Office, Southern District, Eastern District, or somewhere else, um, with the SEC, either the region, New York Regional Office or uh, the Home Office down in D.C. Um, I personally have done both, and I know um, our teams do that kind of all the time. Uh, sometimes we don't, um, and there could be various reasons for that. Sometimes we will get a referral uh, from the SEC to handle a case that, for whatever reason, seems better suited uh, to be handled by our office. Um, and there could be a host of other reasons um, why uh, we might not partner. Uh, but it happens a lot. There's a lot of crossover. One of the challenges, I think uh, it's fair to say, in our office is how do we, um, at the New York Attorney General's office, go about protecting the interests of New York investors um, in a way that makes sense given uh, the other uh, government agencies that are available to do their jobs as well. So it's something that I personally think about all the time. Uh, there's no clear, easy, or right answer. Sometimes it makes sense uh, to partner. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we have different priorities. Um, one of the, I think, um, byproducts of having an elected official um, be the head of our office, one actual person uh, being, being that head, is that priorities uh, from time to time will change. We always have the obligation to enforce the Martin Act in New York, but every attorney general is going to view that obligation a little bit differently. And so um, there's a long, kind of, in my opinion, fascinating history about how different attorneys general approached securities enforcement and regulation um, during their time in office. So as our priorities shift, our um, ability to partner with other agencies will shift as well, and that's kind of an ongoing process. Maybe you could could you speak a bit to sort of what the pri primary priorities are um, for the current Attorney General, Mr. James? What you know has there been a big switch you know in the last few months uh, from the kind of work that you're doing? Me personally, no, uh, and I think it's you know from a sort of historical perspective, uh, the Attorney General has only been in office for two months, so it's sort of impossible to give an answer as to what our priorities will be. Um, maybe more to your point, you know, over time, our office had been uh, has changed probably since the 90s is when Elliot Spitzer uh, came in and really started to do if you want to call it big, sort of systematic investigations of the financial industry in a way that hadn't been done before. Um, that model shifted a bit, uh, I think, when Andrew Cuomo was the Attorney General. In the wake of the financial crisis, uh, we took on a role in the uh, mortgage fraud working group with a number of other uh, federal uh, agencies and brought cases, big, huge cases, with regards to the RMBS frauds. Um, and again, that shifted into the Schneiderman years as uh, priorities changed again. Uh, we've done a number of 
electronic trading cases that were somewhat novel at the time. Um, and then coming into the new administration, I think, you know, we'll, we'll see where the, pri you'll see the priorities shift by the types of cases that we bring publicly. Um, one question maybe for, for all of you is, how do you generate most of your cases? Are there, you know, are you getting tips from the general public? Are these mostly referrals from, you know, law enforcement agencies? How do they come in? Jackie, maybe you could start. So there are a number of ways in which um, we generate cases. Um, it can, you know, as simple as um, we can see something in the press. So we can see an interesting article um, that gets published that, you know, talks about some potential fraud or something along those lines. So it can be as simple as that. Our federal law enforcement partners, like the FBI, um, the Postal Inspection Service, can actually refer cases to us. So. They will um, get tips, they'll follow up on those tips, and then they'll decide to bring a case to partner with the U.S. Attorney's Office. That's another way that we get cases. We can get cases um, from our civil partners, like the SEC, the CFTC. Um, maybe they're working um, uh, or looking into something from a civil perspective, and then they see, you know, there may be a, a criminal angle. Let's call our, our, you know, criminal partners and see if they're interested in doing a parallel criminal investigation. Um, and so there's, there's really just, oftentimes we'll, you know, get a case that ends up sort of, we call them spins, like a spin-off from a case where, you know, you end up looking at one thing and over time it sort of evolves into something different or you look at sort of different cells of activity. Um, so there's sort of an organic way in which we can generate more cases as well. So there are a number of different ways um, that we can end up, um, you know, initiating investigations and ultimately hopefully bringing cases. I'll just add two more buckets on to what Jackie uh, mentioned, which is really the same for us as well. Uh, one of the two buckets I have already mentioned, which is internally we can generate cases through the examination process when, um, you know, we see a problem or a potential problem uh, worthy of an enforcement investigation. And the other is we've got a, um, a, an office of the whistleblower um, that um, started a few years ago. And so what, what, what we get are what are called TCRs, tips, complaints, referrals. Um, which can be filled out online um, on the SEC's website um, or mailed in, I guess. And we've got a whole infrastructure in place, people that look at all the tips that are coming in and make sure they get, you know, appropriately triaged um, and sent to the um, most appropriate regional office, wherever that might be. Um, thousands come in, and obviously everything can't be looked at. You can't jump down every rabbit hole that that you know you read about. But you know some judgments calls need need to be made, um, and then um, investigations start. And there's a financial incentive built in for people as well because they can recover. I should know the percentage here. I think it's something like thirty percent of. Um, whatever the award may be, provided that a bunch of different criteria are met, that it's original information that they're providing, um, and, and other criteria as well. So um, they can, you know, get compensated through that. Yeah, I think it's the same for us. All of those avenues, um, you know, uh, we use as well. And, and one other thing I'll say is in the Attorney General's office, we have a, a wide range of bureaus that do all sorts of work, uh, civil rights, environment, um, labor, um, you name it, taxpayer protection, um, runs the game, consumer frauds, internet. So oftentimes there will be just cross-pollination of ideas or you'll literally just run into someone in the hall and they'll say, hey, I've got a question about what I think might be a securities aspect. Can you, can you talk about it? And so from time to time those will uh, ripen into cases, so it's um, you know we've got a lot of ways to 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 bring cases into our bureau. Gotcha. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the sort of corruption angle, since that's obviously one of the things that Cappy's focused on. Um, Mark, the SEC recently brought charges against Chris Collins. Uh, so for those who don't know, Chris Collins was a, a congressman from upstate New York um, who was recently uh, alleged to have committed some insider trading. Uh, is this common that these kind of financial crimes would be uh, brought against sort of elected officials? Maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, is there sort of financial oversight for elected officials? Is this something we need more of, less of? 
Yeah, so, um, of course, you had to pick the one case that I'm not doing with Jackie's office, but I'm doing with the <laughs> Southern District of New York, or the SEC is doing, actually. So, yeah, um, Chris Collins um, uh, is a, uh, covers the districts of um, in, uh, Rochester and Buffalo, or include, I think it's the 27th district, um, was recently reelected, actually, um, notwithstanding the, the, the current indictment. And uh, as Barrett said, um, they are just allegations. Um, uh, as he's charged and proceeding to trial, um, which is also a really good time for me to give my disclaimer, which I forgot to give earlier, that I am required to, everyone, huh? <laughs> to, to give. Um, so what I'm telling you are my views and not the views of the commission. Um, so, you know, elected officials are subject to, you know, the same securities laws that any of us are here. Um, they, um, because of their role as elected officials, uh, may be um, um, uh, able uh, to, and privy to information that you and I wouldn't be able to get um, or to learn. This case actually is somewhat unique in that he is an elected official, but the information that he is alleged to have received um, came from um, not his capacity as an elected official, but him sitting on a board of a company um, which um, was going through some clinical trials on a drug. And the information was that the clinical trials weren't doing so well. Um, and his son uh, and the son's um, girlfriend and the son's girlfriend's parents held stock um, in this issuer, this drug company. And based on the tip that they received, um, uh, they dumped a lot of the shares before the bad news became public. Because what's going to happen when the bad news becomes public? Stock price is going to drop, which it did. And the one neat part about this case, actually, is that um, there is actually a video. Um, just I wrote a note about the date of it. Uh, right, so um, there is a video. Um, um, that CBS released of um, Jared Kushner walking out of the White House. Um, and, and it was the day um, that, uh, it was the day of the congressional picnic. Um, so it was obviously heavy, heavily covered, right, by the press. And so in the background of Jared Kushner walking out of the White House, you see Chris Collins, um, who we charged, on the, phone, uh, on the phone, pacing back and forth, talking on his cell phone. And we actually have the phone record, and we know who he was calling. Um, at the time and passing along the tip, presumably, that he received, though we don't have a recording of that um, and we obviously don't know what was said, but it, it is a nice visual to the case. But, you know, so here you have an elected official who presumably is held to a high standard and should be held to a high standard, um, but this information was information that was business information. Now, you do have a sort of a separate area of uh, information that's learned um, on the Hill in, in Congress people's capacities um, as government officials. Um, and there was recently, I guess not recently anymore, I think it was 2012, um, the Stock Act was passed, um, stop trading on congressional um, information uh, or knowledge. I guess the K is knowledge. Yeah, yeah. It's still early in the day, isn't it? Um, and that actually created a, an affirmative duty saying if you learn something on the Hill, you have a duty to essentially keep that information and not share it and have, you know, breaching a duty is one of the elements um, that needs to be proved on any insider trading case. Um, so I guess it cleared up that there is a duty, although personally I, I don't know that it added so much to the table because these people had duties to begin with. Um, it's not that a congressperson could have traded on inside information back in 2009 before the Stock Act and gotten away with it, but um, it cleared things up a little bit. Um, so yeah, is, is the case atypical? You know, I don't, I don't know. We, we, there's, there's a lot of areas that we'll look to, whether they're elected officials, whether they're not, but you know, you, you'd hope, um, and again, these are just allegations. Um, he's presumed innocent. Um, he's going to trial. Um, but you, you, you want our elected officials, we want our elected officials to be held to, you know, as high, if not a higher, you know, standard of conduct. Uh, Jackie, one way that um, the U.S. Attorney's Office has been able to sort of address corruption is, like you talked about earlier, with your FCPA prosecutions. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about 
you know, sort of what have been some of the signature prosecutions under that statute for the office and, you know, how you how your unit handles those. Sure. So as I was talking about earlier, um, the, the primary tool we use is the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And that is, a, it is a business fraud. Um, sometimes we have some conflicts with our, you know, public corruption partners in the office because on its face, it seems to be, well, it's, it's, it's corruption, so we should be doing this work. And, and we always come back to that this is, this statute is really about businesses that are bribing foreign officials. Having said that, we don't just have to charge FCPA violations, and nor can we charge foreign officials with violations of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, to be clear. It's a business crime. It's the people who are bribing, not the bribe recipients, who can be charged. However, those um, officials, in the right circumstances, factually, we can charge, for example, with money laundering. So if they know, obviously, that the money they've taken in is a result of illegal conduct, for example, a violation of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and they actually launder that money, they can be charged, again, under the right factual circumstances, with money laundering. So I think a, a good example of this is recently um, we had a series of arrests um, in a case regarding a large financial institution that underwrote three, um, three loans to the government of Mozambique. Um, in the recent years, we had an arrest of two individuals, um, a, a middleman, an intermediary, the sort of individual between the government officials and the business. Um, and we also arrested in the United Kingdom um, three individuals who were former employees of the financial institution. In that indictment, there are other individuals who are also um, also included as defendants. And while they're not named as of yet, that information is currently redacted because they've not been apprehended. As you'll see from the indictment, some of those individuals are actually the foreign officials who were the recipients of the bribes. So that's a sort of you know latest example of that. Our office also did, in terms of our sort of hallmark cases, in November, we unsealed an indictment, or two actually charging instruments um, related to, I don't know if, are you guys familiar with the um, Malaysian 1MDB scandal um, where a sovereign wealth fund of Malaysia um, called 1MDB, um, actually there was a, three, a series of three bond offerings to raise a total of $6 billion, and that was in the 2012 2013 time period, again, those bonds were underwritten by a large U.S. financial institution. Um, and it looks like at least $4 billion of the $6 billion um, were funneled off um, and used as bribes and for all sorts of um, purposes that were not supposed to be the original intent of the bond scheme or the bond offerings. And so in November of this year uh, or last year, we unsealed two charging documents. The first charged um, a former banker of that institution um, with, uh, and also <clears throat> another intermediary, an individual named Jolo, um, and the banker's Roger Ong. And they were charged with both violations um, of the FCPA and then also money laundering. Separately, we unsealed um, another document in which of the for a former banker actually pled guilty to charges, again, the violations of the FCPA and money laundering. And that was, a, a, you know, a, I think made a lot of waves and was sort of the first criminal prosecutions that had been brought in the United States related to the 1MDB scandal. There had been some civil forfeiture actions that had been filed years back, but that was the first you know, criminal prosecutions that had been unsealed. Um, we also announced last year, I think it was June of last year, um, a $860 million um, financial penalty resolution with Societe Generale, um, a French headquartered bank in relation to a bribery scheme in Libya, um, and also the bank's involvement in the rigging of LIBOR rates. So it was actually one overarching resolution in which the bank, um, at its sort of highest level, entered into a defer deferred prosecution agreement, and then a subsidiary actually pled guilty to the Libyan bribery component. 
um, of the sort of dual-pronged prosecution. Um, and so that was in June of last year. It was also the first case that we actually announced a resolution jointly with the PNF in France. So one of the things that we're seeing in the uh, FCPA space is an increasing involvement in um, you know, international coordination, involvement of our foreign law enforcement partners to actually step up and to um, you know, ferret out corruption in their own countries. Um, and to actually, you'll, you've seen an evolution over time of an actual legal framework that's coming into place in a lot of these countries in which those countries too can prosecute um, crimes that are you know, FCPA related. And so what you're seeing increasingly are these you know, joint resolution announcements. Our office also did the odebrecht Brascom resolution in 2016. It was the first sort of international coordination announcement between Singapore, Brazil, and the United States. And that was over a billion dollars. Um, that had to do with the Lava Shadow, the car wash operation down in Brazil, where it was just, you know, basically everybody was being bribed in Brazil over oil. And I mean, you name it, it was just a, a very widespread bribery scheme. Um, but again, that was the first sort of triple country resolution that had been announced. So our office has really been on the forefront of doing those sorts of cases with the FCPA unit in Washington. And one of the things when I was sitting in your shoes, I thought, okay, if I want to be a litigator, that means I have to really do domestic work. I, I don't get to really do too much internationally. There's a lot of, you know, everyone talks about doing international human rights work and things along those lines, and I was very interested in doing that. But if I thought, look, if I want to be a prosecutor, and I, you know, I'm going to end up really being focused on domestic work. I have to say that you know there are tons of opportunities for international work now, increasingly, um, particularly in the criminal space. I mean, I'm planning to travel to Malaysia in a couple of weeks, much to my husband's vast dismay, um, but because then he's stuck with our six-year-olds. But there's just increasing coordination and collaboration with our foreign law enforcement partners, and it's a really um, interesting area of practice that. Of course, because we're prosecuting these cases, there's a whole group of you know defense attorneys and law firms that specialize in doing this work, which then allows um, you know the associates and the partners in those firms to do this sort of international um, kind of focused work. So I always felt when I was in your shoes, I was really limited domestically if I wanted to be a litigator. I can't emphasize enough that I think that the practice has shifted quite a bit um, and that you still have a lot of opportunity to do really interesting international work um, while doing you know, these sorts of cases. Um, well, I do want to leave time for questions, but maybe you could just sort of touching on what Jackie said, do you have sort of advice generally for law students who are interested in, in this type of work and, you know, maybe kind of struggling with this question of, you know, do I go to private practice first? Do I, you know, pursue a career in the public sector? Any sort of parting words for, sure. for our students here? Um, when I was in your seat, I didn't even know what the New York Attorney General was. Um, and so um, I think that maybe the most practical piece of advice I can give you is just look around, um, you know, Google stuff, think of, you know, places where you might not think uh, there might be opportunities to do this kind of work. The states, um, there's FINRA or other uh, quasi-governmental agencies that, that can, you know, be careers in their own right or act as a, as a, a path to government service. Um, you know, I think I would be remiss in saying um, you need to think really critically about your financial situation and loans, um, you know, in terms of being responsible for yourself and your family and whether a career in government service right off the bat makes sense. Um, you know, I would have to say if you've got an overhang of several hundred thousand dollars in loans uh, and you have the ability to go to a firm to get those under control, you need to think really seriously about doing that. Uh, that having been said, it's my experience, and please tell me if, I'm, if it's any different, I think that kind of firm experience, if you can get it, is nothing but a positive uh, in terms of getting into these sorts of roles. I, I, I won't speak for my office in this regard, but I know from our recent experience, all of our uh, recent hires into the Investor Protection Bureau had spent a number of years at a firm doing somewhat similar work. And I, I guess my last point will be, you don't necessarily need to do like securities litigation at your firm if you want to go be a securities litigator. You don't necessarily need to do FCPA if you want to do, 
something that makes sense <laughs> as like a career path, yeah, you want to do that. You don't want to go from here all the way to over there. Um, cause that just, I don't know if that would make sense for where, you know, someone who's going to hire you, but if there is a career path that you want to put yourself on as a general litigator to then move into a different position in government, um, you know, you can, you can go that way. Or if there's a slightly different skill set that you can bring to an office like mine or like theirs that might expand the ability of that unit to do their work, I think that would be really attractive to, to a government agency. So, you know, a little bit of creativity, talk to people, talk to either professors, people like us, we can give you some tips, um, you know, and there, there's, uh, there's a lot out there. Can I just add on to that real quick? So I, just picking up on that, uh, the, the one thing I would say is don't overthink it and don't overgame it out. And what do I mean by that? You know, I remember interviewing when I was at, at my law firm, um, uh, two L's, um, or sorry, one L, or I guess they were second years at the time who were looking for their summer position. And some of the questions I would get are, you know, well, I want to be a prosecutor one day. What courses should I take to be a prosecutor? And my advice is take what you want to take. Take what you're interested in. There's nothing that can set you up like that. You know, the law firms that I chose to go to are places that I actually felt that I would fit in and do really well at. I don't know that anyone at the Southern District, it's not, or a Carrington and, and Donovan Leisure are not filter feeders for AUSAs into the Southern District. But if you go somewhere where you're, you're going to um, excel, where you want to go, if you're going to take courses that you're going to excel, you're going to do well. And that's what's most important. And along those lines, try to partner up with somebody and, and pick a mentor at each of those stages, um, somebody you can learn from. Um, and someone that you can sort of try to, you know, model some of your, you know, thoughts, skills um, after. Um, and you never know when you're going to need reference letters from some of these people as well. So you really want to find someone and, and do well, I think, for that person. All right. Do you guys have questions for, for these guys? Yeah, in the back. So um, Huawei aside, and then again, just to be clear, I have the same disclaimer. These are my own opinions and not the you know, opinions of the department as a whole or my office. Um, so the Huawei case is being prosecuted out of our office jointly with our section and another section. So put Huawei aside. I do think I'll think I'll talk about it sort of more broadly, and I, I think I can speak most directly to it in the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act space, um, where we do, and we're talking about criminal penalties. The guidelines make it such that there is a real punishment financially for a company um, to make that kind of decision, where it's look, you know, if it's going to cost me about the same, you know, whether or not I get caught or not, I'm going to take the chance I don't get caught and the government doesn't, you know, isn't able to sort of get this investigation over the finish line, then I think it would perhaps incentivize folks to pursue, um, you know, criminal acts or uh, incentivize companies to engage in criminality. You know, the, the guidelines are structured in a way, and when we approach resolutions, we want to make sure that this is something that is actually really not an ideal situation. We can't jail a company, right? I mean, that's sort of the bottom line. But what we can do is extract a significant financial penalty for the criminal conduct. And so, you know, the, the way in which we calculate those penalties, in the, embedded in that is the concept of punishment. It also means that oftentimes it's not just, you know, the, 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 um, DOJ that's at the table, but there's also all sorts of regulators, for example, that can also, um, you know, become players. They can do things like revoke licenses. They can make it very difficult for companies to engage in business in certain, you know, specific areas or in countries. So there are a lot of ramifications beyond just sort of like a cost-benefit analysis, at least from a financial perspective. Um, with respect to companies deciding whether or not they want to engage in, in criminality. So, you know, from, from my standpoint, uh, when a company does engage in criminal behavior, 
there are a lot of consequences that can flow from that. And there's also just the reputational risk to a company as well. They have shareholders, things along those lines, or customers who don't necessarily want to, you know, buy products from a company that engages in criminality. So there's a lot of ramifications beyond just a sort of like dollar in, dollar out kind of analysis that I think comes into play when companies are deciding um, how they, you know, want to engage. Maybe one quick question. I think we're actually like right Sorry. at time. But if you had a somebody had a quick question, yes, go for it. Yeah. I think, it, of course, it matters, right? I mean, it, it, I personally have done a number of our electronic trading cases, which deal with high frequency trading and you know private stock venues and all sorts of things. Um, and so I had a steep learning curve. But it, 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 because we're so short on time, anything that you can bring to an office that is 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 developed or different or special can be put to use. And one of the things that I know I think a lot about is how can I keep myself current on changing technology, uh, whether it's cryptocurrency, things like that, or whether it's the most current like document review platform so I can know how the other side is collecting and producing their materials. It's a constant struggle, um, but yeah, absolutely. I think that, the, that that's something that I think about all the time. I'm sure you guys do too. Yeah, Mark, your office has been doing a lot with cyber. Yeah, right? I mean, I'll just the first part of your question is what the way we use technology. I mean, some of the things that the SEC can do to analyze trading data to, to detect patterns of insider trading, for example, is so far beyond what we were doing just back in 2012, 2013, 2014, when I was at the DOJ working with the SEC. I kind of came back and I'm like, wow. Like you hit the acceleration pedal, you know we can f figure out patterns of who's trading, you know who's at the the hedge fund, you know wh where that person went to business school, who they went to business school with, the person's a CFO at the company, they're trading in that issuer stock. I mean, making great connections. So uh, we're using technology as well. All right. Well, I don't want to hold anybody up. So thanks to our panels. This is a great discussion. Thank you. Guys. Thank you.